Welcome to the Calcium Masterclass series brought to you by Shockwave and Optima Education. Today we're in class three imaging of the cornea arterial calcium. I'm Margaret McIntyre from the Golden Jubilee Hospital in Glasgow and I'm here in the studio with my co-host Colm Hanrati from the Matter Hospital in Dublin. Margaret will be talking to us today about the use of IVIS and the detection of coronary artery calcification. We'll then be joined remotely by our good friend Kevin Crose, who will be talking to us about the use of OCT in the evaluation of coronary artery calcification with some insights from the CAD3 trial. But first I'm delighted to introduce Anya Oxnes, who will be talking to us about the detection of coronary artery calcium. It's all about the angiogram. Anya? So thank you for the introduction, Margaret. It's nice to be part of this um, educational calcium masterclass. So I'm going to talk about the detection of coronary artery calcium in our daily practice as interventional cardiologists. And do we need something besides the, the angiogram? So looking at the merits and limitations of different imaging modalities for detecting coronary artery calcium, there's quite a variability in sensitivity and specificity. So the angio has a very high specificity, close to 90%, but the sensitivity is low, and we only get a two-dimensional perspective. Uh, the CT, though, has the advantage of being non-invasive and also have both a high sensitivity and specificity, but the inferior resolution makes it unable to visualize microcalcification and also less able to evaluate calcium thickness, volume, and, and lumen obstruction. So both the IVIS and the OCT are um, highly sensitive and specific in detecting coronary artery calcium. IVIS less so in evaluating the volume and OCT has the drawback of limited penetration through blood needing the added contrast. But uh, these further limitations and, and advantages will be discussed later on, on today. So, this slide shows that coronary calcium develops over a very long period, starting with intimal thickening and the development of fibroatheromas and further into fibrocalcific plaques. But there is a threshold to when we can detect it, and only as the calcification develops will we be able to detect it in clinical imaging. And only as um, uh, and this picture also tells us that with age, as calcification process develops from microfragments into sheets and nodules, the coronary plaque can often go from unstable single vessel disease to a more stable multivessel disease. Um, these calcified nodules though, though can cause a discontinuity in the endothelium, uh, causing acute thrombosis and acute coronary events. So one method for early detection of coronary calcium is the Agatson score, which is a semi-automatic tool calculating a score based on the extent of coronary calcification uh, as detected by an unenhanced low-dose CT. It has its limitation, but it's a valuable tool in cardiac risk scoring and has a good correlation with contrast-enhanced uh, CT. Um, the Agastone score is calculated by multiplying the highest attenuation value in, in um, or, or the highest density by the area or volume of the calcification. So, for example, if you have a calcified spec with a max attenuation of 400 Hounsfield units that occupies 8 square millimeter, millimeter area, you will have a calcium score of 32, and then you sum up every calcified spec throughout your coronary tree, and that gives you the the, um, the calcium score. So this slide tells us that uh, the age adjusted mean calcium score throughout the population uh, obviously increases uh, with age. So this is uh, a video showing what the computer does identifying calcium. So, so the Agatstone score can be calculated quickly and it, and it has a prognostic uh, relevance. Uh, it's actually calculated quite automatically by the software, but it's, it's semi-automatic in the way that a radiographer or a physician needs to go through and check that calcium identified is in the cor correct cardiac structure. So what the next two slides will point out is that even though the sensitivity in detecting calcium with the CT is higher than with the angio, the calcium score has its limitations in the way that it doesn't differentiate between the location of coronary artery calcification and it doesn't say anything about coronary anatomy or luminal encroachment. Uh, 
So here we have a patient with a calcium score of 1070. So you don't go on doing a, a contrast enhanced CT scan. Looking at the angio in this patient, we see that the high calcium score doesn't correlate with the angiography, where we see no coronary obstruction, um, which is also confirmed by physiology. So from the calcium score, this patient is, of course, of increased risk, in cardiovascular risk, but it says nothing about needing any form of coronary intervention. So, um, yeah, the poor clinical utility of the calcium score is shown here, where you see that there is a correlation between plaque volume, but there's a poor correlation with the luminal area. So using the Agatstone score in risk stratification doesn't capture important high-risk patterns in coronary calcification, such as regional distribution, the number of vessels involved, whether it's diffused or concentrated, or the presence of high-risk, low-density density lesions. Um, measurement of calcium, the coronary artery calcium, has consistently proved to be the best subclinical measure in terms of improving cardiac risk prediction. However, the data here suggests that the Agatston score area or volume scores alone are not optimal. We see a positive association between cardiac risk and increasing calcium volume, but there is an inverse association with coronary artery calcification density, giving a more stable plaque. Uh, this figure from Polonsky tells us that if you add calcium score to your risk scores, the low risk score groups will stay the same, but you will increase the proportion of high risk patients. And this tells us that the coronary artery calcium score is best utilized in the intermediate risk groups where treatment decisions may be influenced by improved cardiovascular disease risk prediction. Uh, both the European and the US guidelines recommend CT score as part of cardiovascular risk assessment, particular in this intermediate risk uh, group. The patient, this patient had a high calcium score of 772, uh, predominantly in the RCA, and this table shows you all the information you get from the calcium score. Um, and uh, the, the picture on the right here, is, is the calcium score. So uh, how is the correlation between the calcium score, the CCTA and the coronary angio? So this is a contrast enhanced CT where we see marked calcium in the right and in the LED with also a suspected soft plaque in the mid LED, but not as much calcium in, in the circ. Going to the angio of the same patient, you do appreciate calcium on, on the coronary angio of the right, but there's no visible, there's no stenosis, and there's no visible calcium in the circ, but obviously uh, um, obstructive disease. Uh, LED obviously have obstructive plaque in the mid segment. So there is some correlation between the calcium score and the CCTA and between the CCTA and the coronary angio. Coronary, coronary angio, but while the calcium score gives us the increased risk, a positive CCTA will dedicate the need of coronary intervention after an angio in about 50% of suspected uh, obstructive disease. So here you can appreciate the highly calcified occluded right. Um, even though you know that it's heavily calcified, it's hard to appreciate the course, it's quite ambiguous. Uh, and here we had had a failed attempt to cross the lesion, uh, deciding to have a CT scan to try facilitate success uh, through the second attempt. So on the CT scan, we can appreciate the massive calcium and extreme tortuosity uh, in the proximal right coronary artery. So uh, this is the same patient. So, so the coronary CT has a high sensitivity and specificity for calcium detection. And compared with the calcium score, we can also in, uh, appreciate the location and, and the burden of the calcium and you get a complete coronary tree assessment. Uh, so the, the, the calcium score predicts CTO PCI success rate and the CTO rect Vector score can predict CTO crossing time. So we can use coronary CT to facilitate risk and therapeutic success in, in CTO PCI. Uh, 
when you evaluate the corner angle, the finding of isolated spot is, is defined as mild corner calcification. If you can see multiple opacities through the cardiac cycle, the calcium burden is moderate. And with calcium on both sides of the lumen observed without any cardiac motion, uh, the disease is uh, calcified disease is severe. As the angiographically, uh, as angiographically, the calcium gets more severe as appreciated in OCT by increased arc and thickness and length of calcium. Uh, this is only when you angiographically see severe calcium that also your, your stent's expansion is affected. So angiographically moderate to severe calcified lesion should be further assessed by intravascular imaging while undetectable calcium is less likely to require calcium modification. Uh, coronary angio has a low sensitivity for the detection of calcium and is unable to differentiate between intimal and medial calcific, calcific distribution. So coming back to the heading of this talk in detection of coronary arterial calcium, is it all about the angio? So we've talked about the CT calcium score enhancing cardiovascular risk stratification, but it doesn't determine the presence of obstructive coronary disease. And the CCTA has a high sensitivity, but a low specificity when it comes to obstructive disease in the presence of calcium. So the coronary angiography has a low sensitivity for the calcium, but when there is angiographic moderate to severe calcified lesion, this should be further assessed by intravascular imaging. And severe calcium identified on the angio is associated with stent underexpansion and target lesion failure. So no, it's not all about the angiogram, but it still plays an important role. Thank you. Thanks, Anya. Great uh, overview of both CT and coronary angiography. Um, I'll start just by asking a question, and then I, I know Colin's got, Colin's got a couple of questions for you as well. So first of all, in your day-to-day -day practice, how have you incorporated CT into your management of coronary disease? So we've got quite a big CT practice uh, with us, integrated uh, kind of into the lab. So um, all the acute coronary syndromes that are troponin negative uh, with us will first have a, a CT scan and then go on to a, a, a contrast enhanced CT if the calcium score isn't too high. Uh, and then of course, we'll do the angio afterwards. Um, we also do a, a contrast enhanced CT, coronary CT of all our TAVI patients, looking at all the vessels uh, up front. And what and about your, your stable patients? Yeah, so, so, so um, the stable patients usually admitted outside the hospital to, to private clinics for a CT scan. So I will often have a CT prior, um, prior to, to the angio and many of them. So I think the structural guys wouldn't do a TAVI without doing a pre-procedural CT scan for procedural planning. Um, and I think we're moving towards that direction. How far off are we to have co-registration with the CT scan, do you think, Anya? Oh, um, well, with us, uh, there's uh, not much with that, but uh, hopefully, um, there can be uh, be some shortly. Um, I'm not sure uh, with you, but there's, we haven't started with that here. I think that's going to be the next big step, isn't yeah. it? If you've got co-registration, they're obviously complementary. Um, but if we had co-registration in the labs, I think that would really uh, force us to use pre-procedural planning more, more so. Yeah. And Anya, for CTO work and calcific CTOs, do you CT all of those or just the first failure cases before they come back? No, we don't. We don't CT uh, all of them, uh, but of course, a lot of patients will have a CT scan with stable angina up front, so you will have a CT. So, but it's it's a very good tool to use um, for your second attempt. Um, uh, absolutely, uh, solving the ambiguity of the coronary vessels. I think, especially if there's uh, anatomical ambiguity or the post bypass patient, you can see where the CT scan would give us additional information. Yeah, and I suppose a lot of this is determined by your local availability, exactly. isn't it? So, for instance, we in Glasgow, we've got relative to the volume of patients, it's actually quite difficult to get a CT. 
So I've kind of deliberately just gone round it most of the time um, because it's just, it creates another delay in the process. Whereas you have a setup like Anya has where you have readily available CT, you could see that you might be inclined to use it um, And I think readily. the cardiologists need to have ownership of that, that the radiologists are very good, but the, the, we've got specific questions we, we need to ask. And I think we're best placed to, to provide that information for the interventionist. Within our hospital, actually, it is the cardiologists, cardiologists who interpret the, mm -hmm. the cardiac CTs. So, so you kind of get the clinical ev evaluation uh, together with the CT scan. And moving on to talking about the angiogram, um, you know what the data shows us is that if you can't see any calcium or the calcium is mild, so there's just a few spots, it's okay to go ahead and do your PCI and not worry about it. When you get to that bit in the middle where you see multiple spots through the vessel, so it's more like moderate calcium, where's your threshold there, Anya, for using intravascular imaging? Is, are you waiting till you see severe tramline calcium or are you going to use Ivis or OCT once you see multiple spots? No, I, I think we should um, go early with intravascular imaging because uh, you obviously, it's not always uh, easy to, to evaluate size as well from just the angio. So when there is when there is present of moderate to severe calcium, uh, I'll always go with uh, with imaging to optimize the stand for a good good long term result. And would you normally um, get the imaging out early in the case? You know, so try and use it at the start assess your modification at the end or you know there's always there's been this slightly traditional behavior of getting the IVUS out at the end to check your result it's if like you can I move endorsed rather yeah. than IVUS guide I was or endorsed, it was, it was yeah. endorsed I think I think with us as we don't have the physiologist uh, in our lab so we need to think about uh, what we need early up so so I think we should get it up as soon as you see the angio and have it prepped and then it's uh, quick to use it throughout the procedure and and um, I don't think it uh, makes the procedure any longer. Um, actually, it, it's quicker, you know, that you've done what you need to do. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think if you're going to use expensive technologies, that you should be informed in terms of which technology to select in the right uh, case. And certainly for any sort of complexity, I think the imaging up front really uh, accelerates your procedure. It's very efficient. Okay, yeah, and obviously going to go on and talk about that um, through the rest of this uh, webinar today. So um, fantastic, Anya. You, any other comments? That was a, a great overview. I think that's good. So thank okay. you so much. Nice to see me. you and thanks for contributing. Bye. Bye. Okay, so we're back in the studio and the next talk is from Margaret McIntaggart, who's going to talk to us about the use of IVIS in the detection of coronary calcification. Thanks, Colm. So intravascular imaging is sensitive for the detection of coronary artery calcium. We know from what Anya showed us earlier on that coronary angiography is insensitive to detect calcium, only detecting it in approximately 40% of lesions where we know it to be present. OCT is more sensitive, detecting, detecting it in approximately 77%, and IVIS is the most sensitive intravascular technique and detects calcium in 83% of lesions. If we look at how the appearance of calcium compares from IVIS to OCT, you can see in the IVIS image here on the left that calcium appears as this high signal intensity white appearance with a dropout behind, whereas in the OCT on the right hand side you see this low signal intensity well demarcated area in the vessel wall. Both IVIS and OCT will allow you to measure your arc of calcium and your length of calcium. But IVIS, because of the reflection of the acoustic waves, can't allow you to get a quantitative measure of depth, thickness or volume, whereas OCT will allow you, because you can see both edges and the well demarcated area of calcium, you can measure depth, thickness and therefore the volume of calcium. So both IVIS and OCT have advantages and disadvantages. So if we think about IVIS first, so the advantages of IVIS are, as I said, you can look at the distribution of calcium, measure the arc and the length of calcium. It penetrates to the adventitia and will give you an accurate assessment of the vessel size. It's useful during CTO PCI, you can use it to assess the proximal cap, but also importantly, if you're extra plaque in the submintimal space, it's safe to use it without the risk of hydraulic dissection. And that we, there's now extensive published data showing that IVIS use predicts a better stent and long-term clinical outcome. 
disadvantages of IVAs are that you get signal dropout behind calcium. It, it'll give you a limited assessment of calcium thickness. We'll go on to look at that later on. Once you, if you're using it after stenting, during follow-up, your assessment of stent strut coverage is not possible. And also you get limited tissue characterization. So what about OCT? So advantages of OCT, in addition to measuring the length of calcium in the arc, you can also quantitatively measure the depth and the thickness. Um, and it's easier with OCT, as we'll see later on um, when Kevin speaks, to detect calcium fracture. Disadvantages of IVAs, you have to give additional contrast volume. You, you, there's a requirement to clear the vessel of blood, so you have to have a big enough lumen within the vessel to be able to use the contrast to clear the blood away to get adequate imaging. This sometimes therefore will require lesion preparation or predilatation before you get a baseline OCT run. There is limited penetration into the vessel wall, so it can be quite difficult to size larger vessels. And in CTO PCI, there's a concern that if you've, if you've used dissection re-entry techniques and you've created some interval planes or extra plaque tracks, that if you inject contrast for OCT, you can extend these. There is, if, from the historical OCT catheters, they were considered to be a bit less del deliverable by the, than the IVAS catheters, but this is improving as the technology evolves. So if we look at calcified nodules, the appearance actually with IVAS and OCT is quite similar. You see this protruding bright tissue into the vessel lumen. If we look at concentric calcium, you see on the left with the IVAS, you see this bright white arc of calcium almost circumferentially around that luminal border. And you see on the right with the OCT, this very well demarcated, quite thick uh, arc of calcium all the way around the circumference of that vessel. So we concentrate on IVUS now. So when you're assessing calcium burden with IVUS, the two key things you're really gonna look at is the arc of calcium and the length of calcium. So you can see here that this image on the, the left has a small arc of calcium on the right-hand side of the vessel and a further very small arc on the left, whereas the image on the right has a very large 270-degree arc of calcium, which is more of a concern. We can either describe the arc as the angle, uh, as you see here, 270 degrees, or you can describe it as how many quadrants of the vessel are involved in the calcium. So you see here in the left, there's a small arc of about 80 degrees involving one quadrant, whereas on the right, there's a much larger arc involving three quadrants. As I said, in the longitudinal pullback, you can measure the length of your calcified segments. And if you take this together with the arc, and a qualitative assessment of depth of calcium, we get some uh, sense of what the volumetric uh, burden of the calcium is in the vessel. Coming back to this issue of thickness, the main limitation of IVAS compared to OCT is you can't quantitatively measure the thickness of the calcium. So if you look at the two IVAS images in this slide, they actually look quite similar. If you look at the two OCT pictures, they're quite different. So that IVAS on the left is a thin layer of calcium. And you can see that very clearly on the OCT image. Whereas on the right, there's a very thick chunk of calcium behind that bright white leading edge of the calcium seen on the IVAS. Cal IVAS can give you some sense of the depth of calcium in the vessel wall. So on the left-hand side here, you see superficial calcium at the intimal luminal border. And on the right-hand side, you can see there's a, a deep layer of calcium uh, in the vessel, more towards the medial adventitial border. You can describe this either as its location in relation to the layers of the vessel or whether it's in the 50% of plaque closer to the lumen or the 50% of plaque closer to the adventitia. Okay, so just some cases to illustrate these points. So this is a still angiogram um, of a left coronary system. And what you can see there is there's angiographically severe calcium both in what looks like the distal left main and the proximal LED. So you see calcium on both sides of the vessel wall without cardiac motion. If we go on and look at the moving angiogram, what we can see is that the calcium in the distal left main looks like it's possibly nodular just from its morphology there in the angiogram, whereas the calcium further down in the LED looks like it's non-nodular. So what does the IVUS show us? So in the mid LED, um, where the calcium looked like it was moderate. Indeed, there's 90 degree arcs of calcium like you see on the IVUS image, still the IVUS image on the right hand side. As we move further up the vessel to in front of the, the diagonal system, the calcium becomes more severe and the arcs of calcium become 270 degrees. 
And as we get to that area that looks nodular in the angiogram, indeed, it is a nodule protruding into the vessel. But in fact, it was more in the ostium of the LED than in the left main itself. So IVIS contributed a lot to this case in terms of how we're going to deal with the case um, and what level of calcium modification we required in different areas of the vessel. So let's look at the second case. So again, this is a still angiogram of a left coronary system. There's an area of severe angiographic calcification in the proximal LED, where we can see calcium on both sides of the vessel without cardiac motion. If we look at the circumflex, the calcification of the circumflex looks less severe. There are some areas of calcium down the length of the mid proximal mid-circumflex, but probably more moderate. And you can see also in the distal left main into the proximal LED, there's a kind of unilateral plate of calcium um, across that segment of the vessel. So what did the um, what did the, the IVIS shows, show us? And I'm particularly going to concentrate here in the circumflex. So in the mid-circumflex, where actually in the angiogram it looked like the calcium was only on one side of the vessel and was more moderate. In fact, the calcium there was severe in the IVIS and there was 270 degree arc up through that segment in the mid-circumflex. The other interesting thing in this case um, was that there was areas of, of combined superficial and deep layers of calcium that we could see very clearly on the IVIS. So in this case here, this was a right coronary artery with severe angiographic calcium, both in the proximal and mid vessel. You can see calcium on both sides of the wall without cardiac motion. And then when we look at the moving angiogram, indeed that confirms that. So this is a very heavily calcified uh, proximal to mid RCA with some tortuosity as well that's going to cause us some further problems. So this can be a problem for both modalities of imaging. So the delivery of the imaging catheters through this type of vessel can be difficult and sometimes not possible. In addition to deliverability of the catheter, for OCT, as I explained earlier on, one of the problems can be clearance of the blood out of the vessel to allow the vessel to fill with contrast and allow you to get adequate imaging. And it's likely you're going to probably have to pre-treat that segment before you're going to be able to get a good OCT image. As also mentioned earlier on, in this situation, even if you can get the IVIS down, we're going to have problems related to signal dropout behind the calcium and an assessment of how deep that calcium is. So what we did in this case was we used IVL and we treated that whole segment of the proximal to mid RCA. And what you can see in this uh, moving angiogram is the first thing that strikes you is you see the calcium plates are moving separately. So we've disrupt, disrupted what I presume was concentric calcium into multiple plates of calcium that are moving um, separate from each other. And you start to see some fractures come in, and I'll show you those more clearly in the next slide. So as we came up through that mid to proximal RCA, there was fractures in multiple locations that are highlighted here by the arrows. So we had very nice calcium modification with the shock wave device in this uh, long segment of disease. I wanted to come back in this case to illustrate this issue about whether you can use IVIS to assess thin and thick calcium. So in this very short uh, moving picture from that same vessel, if you look at where these arrows are, you see this reverberation behind the calcium. It's almost like echoes or ripples in a pond behind that plate of calcium. So there's a small amount of data that suggests if you have a smooth a bright white surface of calcium like you can see there between 7 and 11 o'clock with these reverberations behind that's likely to represent thin calcium if you then go on and reassess it with OCT. Alternatively if you look down towards 6 o'clock and this is also in the same vessel you can see that the calcium in this area it has an irregular appearance without that re reverberation behind it. And there's, again, some data from the same paper to suggest that that appearance is more consistent with thick calcium. So one final case. So this is um, a still image of a left coronary system. The first thing you can see is that there's stents in that in, in this vessel from before. But actually there's some, if you look very closely, maybe some isolated spots of vis visible calcium, but certainly nothing that looks moderate or severe. When we go on and look at the moving picture, what you see is that there's a patent stent in the LED. There's disease in the left main bifurcation down into the circumflex. And you might be able to appreciate there's a previous stent in the OM which is occluded. So this is a CTO of the circumflex involving an occluded stent in the OM with distal left main bifurcation disease. And again, if you look around the left main bifurcation and down into the circumflex, not convinced really angiographically there's any significant calcium there.
So we opened the CTO and went on to perform IVIS from the OM back through the proximal circuit into the left main. And I've just concentrated here on the very ostium of the circumflex. That first wire you can see coming in at nine o'clock from that high OM1 or intermediate. And the wire you can see coming in at 11 p.m. is from the LED. So what we can appreciate here is that it actually is concentric calcium involving that osteoproximal circumflex back in to the left main bifurcation that was completely unappreciated on the angiogram. So in this case, we went on to treat both limbs actually the bifurcation with IVL, and this is the the IVIS following that. Now, what I, the reason I'm showing you this case is to show you that sometimes in IVIS it can be difficult to pick up fracture or modification of the calcium itself. And what I did in this case was using the wires in the side branches as markers, I was able to compare the two same frames to see how much I'd affected the luminal gain. So what you see here is the same frame. You see the luminal, the lumen size on the left before IVL and the lumen size on the right after IVL. So this is a this is quite a nice way if you can't, if you're not sure if you modified the calcium when you're using IVIS to compare segments and use side branches so you can co-locate where you're measuring your minimal luminal area. So to conclude, IVIS has the highest sensitivity for calcium detection in comparison to OCT and angiography. It allows you to measure the size of the arc of calcium, the length of your calcified segments. You can get some qualitative assessment of whether the calcium is superficial or deep. You can have a limited assessment of whether you think it's thick or not using the smooth or the irregular surface with or without reverberation. You can usually detect calcium fracture, and if you can, you can assess the effect of your modification device on luminal gain. One big advantage of IVIS is you're not using contrast, so you can do unlimited runs, and obviously it's safe to use extra plaque during CTO PCI. Thank you. Great, well, thank you very much, Margaret. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, I know your practice is very skewed, and most of it is, certainly the elective stuff is complex cases. What percentage of those cases do you think intercoronary imaging informs your decision? So you're right, um, I think we are slightly skewed, especially those of us that focus most of our work on complex uh, calcific or CTO disease. Um, I think I've yet to have a case where I've taken IVOS or OCT out and I don't think it informs my decision making in the case. And I've moved very much towards using very high proportion of imaging. And in fact, I feel uncomfortable now not imaging a case. You know, I, I actually have to make a conscious decision not to IVOS or OCT a case. Um, and, you know, some of that is because there's obviously fiscal constraints in our practice. And if there wasn't, I would image every case. Because firstly, I believe the evidence that it improves outcomes, but also I feel like I learn from every case where I get the imaging catheter out. I never take it out and think that was a waste of time. Um, so yeah, so I'm a very strong uh, supporter. And I think in addition that the more you do it and the more slick you become at it and your team in the room becomes at it, the more efficient it becomes. And um, we'll hear obviously from Kevin later about the OCT data, but there's now a growing body of evidence showing it doesn't add time to your procedures. Um, and it probably reduces your volume of contrast in your procedures um, as well. I think for the more complex cases, it probably uh, expedites the, the procedure. Yeah. What percentage of a uh, stent failure? You showed, you showed a case of, of a stent failure, yeah. and then we, when you imaged and saw upstream, that, that disease was probably there for you know, predating the, the original stent. Yeah. What percentage of cases where you've got a stent failure do you think you will find a mechanical issue that uh, maybe could have prevented that stent failure? Yeah, so I don't know, you know the exact uh, numbers. I haven't, I haven't looked at that instinctively. I would guess stent under expansion due to pre-existing calcific disease maybe accounts for about half of our stents that failure cases, and then the other half probably calcific neoatherosclerosis. Yeah. I think imaging in stent failure is vital. Um, firstly, to determine whether there has been a problem with the vessel's been under pre-treated before it's been sent to the first instance, whether there's a problem with the stent itself that's fractured. Um, and also to characterise what the restenosis or the occlusive restenosis looks like, you know, is it fibrotic, is it calcific, how are you going to deal with it? What is the, the burden of that? Um, because obviously then you're going to have to make decisions about whether you use second layer stent, whether you use drug yes. and balloons, do you cut it, do you score it, what do you, you do you use IVL if there's calcium behind the stent. So um, I think it's vital to try and, and we, you know, we know that once you've had a stent failure once, 
your risk of that stent feeling again or that, that lesion feeling again is much higher. And certainly that stent is failed because of under preparation of the vessel at the index procedure, it's very hard to deal with that scenario. Yeah, very. So I think that's, that's a very important message. Do it right the first time. Yeah. We've all got those cases in our practice that come back every 12 months with restenosis of a, a stent and or you, you end up extending stented segments in the same vessel, they get close of eyes, are you reopen it? You drug, I've, you'll get several cases in my practice that I've been looking after for years. Yeah. You bounce back in every now and then and you kind of patch up the stent because there's no other option for them surgically or it's a single vessel problem, it's a circumflex and the LED in the right is normal. So I think the importance of using imaging up front to make sure you get the stent right the first time avoids, avoids that problem. Because the time machine doesn't exist yet to go back and, and undo it. I know, I know. In terms of the, uh, you, you know, we showed clearly the benefits of, of intercoronary imaging. Um, and one thing I struggle with myself, I know thickness is an important measure. Um, do you think thickness is more important than arc or how would you rate those in terms of the practicalities uh, in the lab? Yeah, so I think it, it's interesting. Since the evolution of all these algorithms we've all been using in the last couple of years, and we've all really been thinking quite carefully about um, systematically assessing the calcium. I think initially we were all very focused on the concentric calcium aspects and I think with IVL that's pretty much been dealt with. Um, we can now deal with that very well. Um, I think the remaining problem for us um, is that eccentric thick calcium. Um, you know, so maybe like a, you know, 120 to 180 degree area of calcium but it's really dense and thick and no matter what you do, you end up with a kind of D-shaped stent at the end. You've got a good stent area, but it's still eccentric. And so I, I think to, for me, and my, my feeling and my experience is thickness becomes increasingly important in that setting. Yeah. Um, Whereas a concentric thick lesion, you know you're going to get a very good result with, with exactly, lithotripsy. Exactly, because obviously the, yeah, the problem obviously is if you have the eccentric thickness is that you know, we, it, it looks from the data that's available that lithotripsy also will impact on that. Um, the problem obviously is this issue about dissipation of the energy out the other side of the vessel wall where it doesn't rebound because there's no calcium to reflect uh, across. So I think that is where thickness really becomes important. And when you put in your stent, you can tear that interface between the calcified nodule and the vessel uh, and a perforation is more likely. High location for, for perforation risk. Brilliant. Well, listen, that was a fantastic talk. Thank you for that, Margaret. Thanks, Colin. So our final guest today is Kevin Cruz, who will be talking us through the role of OCT in the evaluation of coronary artery calcium with some insights from the Disrupt CAD3 study. Kevin? Thanks, Margaret. I appreciate the opportunity to take part in today's program. I'm going to be speaking on the role of OCT in the evaluation of coronary artery calcium, insights from CAD3. So intravascular imaging is well accepted, it's very sensitive compared to angiography for the detection of coronary artery calcium. As we know, IVIS and OCT are both able to pick up, detect, and characterize calcium much better than angiography. And interestingly, unlike uh, IVIS, OCT is actually able to give us information about the thickness of calcium. So these two imaging modalities are really starting to transform our approach to treating PCI patients who have a significant amount of calcium. And the understanding of the calcium burden, thickness, and length is something which has really been a new development in terms of transforming our approach to treating these patients. So if you compare the appearance of calcium between IVIS and OCT, by IVIS, calcium has a high signal intensity with dropout behind it. In a very different way, OCT has a well demarcated area of low signal intensity. Sometimes people confuse lipid versus calcium uh, by OCT. And if you have a lipidic region, you have a similar dropout, but the borders are very poorly defined. Like the example here, when you have calcium, it's signal dropout or loss of signal with, with really well-defined borders. And so this is the prototypical look of what calcium looks like by OCT. When you consider intravascular imaging of IVIS versus OCT and the patterns of coronary artery calcium, for intervascular ultrasound, it allows assessment of the distribution of the calcium arc. But because um, you, you can definitely see the adventitious to allow mid-wall or tree vessel sizing, one of the disadvantages of IVIS is that there's signal dropout beyond the calcium, which impairs your ability to determine the thickness of the calcium. OCT also allows you to assess the distribution and arc of calcium, but in, in, a, in a way which is very helpful 
see them depth and thickness. And it's also easier because of the better resolution of OCT to understand uh, a fracture of calcium when treating. One of the disadvantages of OCT is it requires contrast to flush the vessel. There are some ways to do this by saline, which are under development and have been very successful with sort of early centers that are applying saline-based OCT in a regular way. If you look at the ability of IVIS versus OCT to characterize calcific nodule, an example is shown here. The calcific nodule is actually a thick area of calcium, often it protrudes into the lumen as shown here. And typically you can get a, a relatively uh, good sense from both technologies in terms of the depth. It really depends upon how much of a dropout there is in the IVIS. And you can see in this particular example, there's also a dropout of the signal behind the calcific nodule by OCT. This is variable. In some cases, by OCT, you can actually see the entire thickness and measure it. All it really does, it does depend upon the case. This is what concentric calcium looks like by OCT and by IVIS. And as spoken about already, you can see because of the signal dropout or attenuation uh, behind the IVIS image, you really can't get a sense of the thickness. Where by OCT, you can very precisely measure the thickness of calcium, which has benefits in terms of understanding how much there is, how thick it is, and what the best option may be vessel preparation. You look at the thickness of calcium in terms of nodular calcium, you can see here, you can measure it in this particular example I spoke about before, compared to the IVIS here with a dropout. And this is looking at superficial calcium by OCT on the left panel. Again, you have dropout on the IVIS where it's difficult to measure the thickness. Looking at calcium fractures post intravascular lithotripsy, you can see very easily they're detected, detected at the discontinuity of the calcium shelf by OCT. They can be seen by uh, IVIS, although it's a little bit tougher to appreciate them. So there is an enhanced sensitivity by OCT for looking at calcium fractures post-vessel preparation treatment. If you look at calcium fracture, it also can be defined in the longitudinal view as shown here. A shelf of calcium over a long segment of the vessel is uh, has a discontinuous uh, disconnection here. And so effectively, you can look at it in a cross-sectional view, and also in the length view, uh, as shown in this particular example. Intravascular imaging, some of the limitations in terms of assessing coronary artery calcium, obviously is in calcific vessels that can be somewhat difficult to deliver the imaging catheter. And this really varies based on which IVIS catheter you're using, or potentially uh, based on the structure of the OCT catheter, which has a little bit less forward push compared to some of the IVIS technologies. The other thing which you have to be able to do to get good OCT images is you actually have to be able to clear the blood uh, from the artery. This is difficult if the OCT catheter is occlusive in a tight lesion. And so many times as we apply OCT to complex PCI, we'll do a little bit of vessel prep with a balloon to be able to get enough space to get clearance. One of the other important tips for using OCT in relatively tight lesions is to use the manual mode to trigger the OCT pullback rather than the automated pullback mode it allows you to actually get the run done by OCT with higher fidelity with less fits and starts in terms of injecting and not having the, the computer actually activate the pullback in a timely fashion. One of the most useful uh, structures in terms of how to define coronary artery calcium is outlined in this publication from 2018 from CRF Group. This is a, a paper which I ask all of our interventional fellows to read. It's one of the most important things which informs how we move forward in terms of assessing calcium in complex PCI. This is a calcium scoring system, also known as a calcium volume index, the CVI. And one of the most important things which we sort of struggle with in teaching people complex PCI is the fact that there's no standardization to advanced vessel preparation. Some people use orbital or roto a lot, other, pay, other doctors are reluctant to. And thinking about when technologies like shockwave might be utilized, it's helpful to understand the impact of a certain calcium signature on stent expansion. This data can start to get consistency in terms of calcium assessment as it relates to something really important, obviously stent expansion. And so in this scoring system, as the calcium mark goes from 90 to 180 degrees, you get one point. If the calcium mark is greater than 180 degrees, you get two points. Two points. If the calcium thickness is greater than half a millimeter, or the length is greater than five millimeters, you get an additional point. And so effectively, as you go from zero to four on this calcium volume index score, with three and four points being the place where you start to see a precipitous drop-off in stent expansion. So this is important because when you start to see a specific signal of calcium defined by the scoring system, 
we need to start to consider advanced vessel preparation. This is an example of thick calcium greater than 180 degrees with a length of more than five millimeters. And so this has a CVI score of four, in which case I think advanced vessel prep everyone would agree to be warranted, especially based on the thickness seen here. One of the things we've been working hard to apply is a new prescriptive methodology to do pre-assessment by OCT and post-PCI assessment in a standardized way. We've named this workflow MLE Max really as, as a consistent and agreed upon prescriptive OCT PHCI optimization strategy. The MLD refers to the pre-PCI OCT where we determine the strategy, assessing M, the morphology, determining the length of the stent, and then determining the diameter stent based on the distal reference segment. And to apply this in a very prescriptive way has been something which has been happening in the US across several centers really with a goal towards studying how this prescriptive strategy behaves in real-world practice. After the stent is placed and post-dilated, the post-PCI OCT drives stent optimization. And there the acronym is MAX, looking for presence or absence of medial dissections at the edges of the stent, assessing out position, and then looking very critically to see if we have good expansion. And so when we apply this MLD MAX strategy, we're looking to determine the vessel morphology pre, optimize black preparation and vessel preparation, the idea that we're looking to get excellent stent expansion at the end of the case, where you have medial dissections at the edges, and also determining that we have good stent acquisition. When you apply the MLD MAC strategy in our light lab program, which is across 12 U.S. centers with over 40 operators in real-world practice, we see that the impact of the pre-PCI OCT changes diagnosis and decision-making in 83% of lesions. And if you look here, many of the things highlighted in dark blue are certain changes based on what the physician would have done on the angiogram. After doing the pre-PCI OCT, you can see the lesion type, the lesion evaluation, the type of vessel prep, and how you actually end up treating in terms of diameter are really things which are changed by assessing the vessel with imaging up front. And on the back end, if you take this MLD max prescriptive strategy, the majority of impact is in the planning. If you plan the case correctly, you have a lot less to do on the back end to optimize. You can see on the post-PCI OCT, the impact of the imaging was actually only 31% of the lesions because you got it right up front. This is the difference between just checking on the back end and doing an OCT endorsed PCI versus doing one where you actually plan the case in a very prescriptive way based on data, based on clearly knowing what is going on in terms of the morphology, the length, and the diameter of the artery. In cases where OCT detected calcium in light lab, you can see that 47% of the time when calcium was detected, the physician changed their vessel preparation strategy, either to pre-dilation with compliant or non-compliant balloons, to escalation to cutting or scoring balloons, or in 25% of cases, escalation to atherectomy or laser. And so we talked before about the fact that imaging detects calcium with a greater sensitivity than angiography. When it detected it in our light lab program, it changed vessel preparation almost half the time. So I think it really is a call to action to be able to assess vessel morphology, assess calcium burden, because when we use imaging, we see that a significant portion of the time calcium is there when we don't detect it angiographically, and it changes what we do in terms of the vessel prep strategy. So if you look at the uh, data from uh, the recent Shockwave publication, thinking about the procedural characteristics of the OCT substudy, which was 100 patients compared to the non-OCT, which is 331. The demographics in these two groups are relatively similar. Predilation was a little bit higher in the non-OCT group. The number of IVL catheters used between the two, uh, two groups was 1.3 to 1.2. The inflation pressures were very similar. The number of pulses were relatively similar. The post-IVL dilation was pretty similar. The number of stents used was similar. Post-stent dilation was uh, post stent dilatation was uh, equal in both groups, and the procedure time is very similar. And this is something we've actually seen from our light lab program. If you use a prescriptive OCT based strategy, it does not add time to the procedure, probably because you're making decisions in a very rational way and have less to do because you're working on a template of knowing exactly how the case should run based on the intravascular imaging data. Looking here at the calcium fracture characteristic, post IVL versus post stent. You can see that the number of fractures in terms of the times when they weren't seen was pretty similar, single fractures was similar, and multiple fractures was 
was quite similar. And so the fracture depth also was similar, as was the fracture width. It was a little bit bigger post-stent after you actually stent the vessel open. But effectively, you see that post-IVL to post-stent, there is a significant ability to detect fractures in this particular subset. If you look at outcomes by fracture visualization, interestingly, minimal stent area was similar, stent expansion was similar, and the area of stenosis is similar. And so the question, if you don't see fractures by OCT, how are we able to then get to the place where the stent expansion and area of stenosis is similar? And that's probably because even though the OCT is more sensitive than I at detecting fracture, there probably is fracture of the calcium, which is microscopic and can't be detected by OCT. That is the premise of why even in the absence of OCT detected calcium fractures, you get very good stent uh, expansion using the IVL technology. And so in order to, uh, to you know, uh, show an example case here, we have a, a patient who uh, had a significant amount of calcium that we're going to run through. And so this is a 71-year-old gentleman with an acute coronary syndrome, normal left ventricular function. And interestingly, he had an anomalous left coronary arising from the right coronary cusp. And you can see that the culprit for his acute coronary syndrome was this large, super dominant, because of his very anatomy, right coronary artery, with a significant amount of calcium and a near functional occlusion in the mid segment. So we plan to do RCA PCI for this patient. You can see the culprit here. The fluoroscopic calcium was quite marked. The plan here was to use a temporary pacing wire for this case, given the amount of myocardium subtended and the fact that we figured we were going to need to use a significant amount of atherectomy. We took a supportive guide with nail one, crossed with a pilot 50. I used the turnpike LP to get through and change for a Viper Flex, which is the wire which we use with our orbital atherectomy device. Here shows the wire exchange of the turnpike LP. For the initial orbital, we did 14 runs in this highly calcified segment, seven on low speed and seven on high speed. And then we did not see much audible or hear much audible change in the uh, device as we were passing through toward the end. And so we figured, we hoped we'd achieve adequate vessel prep. Despite the 14 runs of orbital, a significant number of the neon high, the balloon is still unexpandable. We did an initial additional nine runs of orbital on high speed, hoping to get additional vessel preparation. I chose orbital in this case because of the large caliber of the artery, figuring out the mechanism of rotation in 360 degrees would help to get adequate vessel preparation. Despite the 23 months of orbital atherectomy, our 35 by 6 angiosculpt at very high pressure was still unexpandable. In this particular case, we figured it'd be important to get a clear idea of what was going on in the artery. Three runs of orbital, you can see that there's a significant amount of calcium still. Um, we debulked it partially, but not completely. And still, there was about 1.2 millimeters of circumferential calcium. This is in large part owing to the high, uh, the large caliber of the artery. In fact, that despite using orbital, to significant number of runs, we still were unable to crack the calcium in this particular example. So we took a shockwave balloon. You can see the initial inflation is here. The balloon is constricted in multiple segments. And after treatment, we were able to get good expansion. So at this point, we were pleased in terms of the ability to get the balloons to expand. We did additional vessel preparation with, with NC balloons, which expanded well. We placed four overlapping four, uh, four millimeter Zion struggling uh, stents. We post dilated with four, five, and five O and C balloons based on the OCT guidance of the vessel sizing. And in this proximal segment, actually one of the balloons ruptured. And we actually saw that there was an angiographic filling defect here. So we did an additional OCT, which actually showed that we had acute stent fracture. Here's the discontinuity of the stent that was placed. And you can see proximal in the area of the stent fracture on this calcific nodule and distal stent. And I can assure you that we didn't miss that area by not overlapping the stent. This is an area which we clearly stented, which had acute stent fracture on nodules, which is a known entity. And so unfortunately, the only way they really deal with this is to further uh, dilate it, which we did. And we placed one additional stent with a 4028 science. Did a final OCT run, which showed excellent expansion. Here's the final results here. The entire segment proximal was post dilated with a five millimeter non-compliant balloon. And so I think it shows, it, it's a case that shows the example of the value of imaging in terms of understanding what's going on. And the ability to use complementary uh, new technologies in terms of optimizing the ability to deliver gear with a mechanical atherectomy device. In this particular example, if that fails because of the significant calcium burden, intravascular lift trips, it really can be transformative in these types of cases. 
And so by way of summary, calcium reduces stent expansion and worsens PCI durability. Modern image-guided workflows assess calcium to guide vessel preparation to optimize stenting. And MLD Max is our current way of using imaging in a prescriptive way to guide how we treat patients, especially patients which have coronary uh, artery calcium. Intravascular imaging impacts procedural decision-making and the vessel preparation strategy. This is the data I shared from our light lab study. In intravascular uh, lithotripsy shockwave, facilitates calcium modification to help to optimize stent expansion. I appreciate the opportunity to take part in today's program. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. Great talk. Um, just a few things uh, that I think came out of the the OCCT substudy of the Strup CAD 3 to start with. So the first thing I wondered about your thoughts on were the data suggest showing that OCT doesn't prolong the procedures. Obviously people have you know, will argue that they don't use imaging because it makes the procedures longer. Uh, and it looks like from you know from this data that's not the, the case. What what's your take on that? Yeah, I think, you know, the, we, we have similar kernels of information from the Light Lab study, which was a 12 hospital, 40 operator OCT study looking at this prescriptive MLD max workflow. And the messaging is consistent. When you use imaging up front to plan your procedure, you know in a very deliberate way what you're going to do, as opposed to just checking on the back end and having a lot more work to do. It's not surprising and it's consistent that a prescriptive imaging strategy, strategy up front saves steps. We've shown that in other workflow studies, but it also saves time. And so I think, you know, it really bubbles up to the top of our cognition that image guided image plan procedures are a state of the art way to do this, where you hopefully optimize results, but more importantly, you're not adding a bunch of time to the procedure. Yeah, you showed a very straightforward case there, Kevin. What was it? Uh, <laughs> Thirty-five odd runs with a uh, <laughs> calcium <laughs> modification in regard. Can you describe how this technology are, are, are complementary and synergistic with the other forms of calcium modification that we have? Yeah, I think you know uh, deliverability in the type of case that I showed is, is always an issue. So um, there is a complementarity between mechanical atherectomy and lithotripsy, and I, I chose that case in particular because you know despite 23 runs of orbital, you can see the calcium burden was so substantial that using a device with a different mechanism of action really paid tremendous dividends. And so we're very comfortable now prepping lesions, at least initially with mechanical atherectomy. And those devices are unsuccessful, especially large devices, where in this case, the OCT showed a tremendous calcium burden. I think there is a clear advantage to using a lithotripsy to try to manage that, modify the calcium in a different way and get good results and eventually good extent expansion and, and hopefully that, better outcomes for patients. With that degree of disease burden, you probably wouldn't be able to get the lithotripsy there uh, initially. So using the mechanical atherectomy uh, and then when required for the, for the concentric uh, calcification in the large vessel, was certainly synergistic. Yeah, without question, I could barely get the microcatheter through. So there's no way I was going to deliver any sort of balloon. Um, you know, there, there, there's been a cute cadence in our lab, you know, rototripsy and orbit tripsy as, uh, as a way to sort of bucket the fact that the technologies are complementary, especially in cases like the one I showed. So Kevin, we all have experience in our cases day to day where you use some form of calcium modification and then you image again and you're not really sure whether you've fractured the calcium or not. Um, you maybe see that the lumen's larger, but you maybe are not entirely convinced. And I think that's a phenomenon generally is more common when you're using IVUS than it is with OCT with the resolution issue. I think coming back to the disrupt data again, it was interesting to see that even the patients where there was no visible fracture still had the same stent expansion, stent outcomes as the patients that had visible fracture. What, what, what's your thoughts about that? Yeah, I think if we talk to an expert base in this space, you know, it may be a uh, inability of the OCT based on resolution to see fractures which are still clinically important. I think it's been pointed out that micro CT fractures um, are probably what are present, but not detected by the OCT. And that may explain why even in cases where OCT didn't show large fractures, we were able with lithotripsy to get good stent expansion, similar uh, to cases where fractures were seen. Uh, so Margaret and I discussed this question earlier, so hopefully you don't give a, co a contradictory answer, but which do you think is more relevant, the arc of the calcium or the thickness of the calcium? Yeah, I think, you know, it, 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 it probably, at least in the calcium volume index where the data we showed, um, the two matter uh, in combination. I think if I had to choose the one which makes me um, 
most uh, anxious from a vessel prep standpoint, it's thickness. Because like the case I showed, I mean, if you've got a thin, uh, if you've got a, a 360 degree arc, but it's quite thin, it's a lot easier to address as opposed to a rind of two millimeters, which was probably present in the case I showed, where even 23 runs of mechanical atherectomy were unable to modify in a way which would lead to good expansion. So my vote would be thickness. You know, super thick calcium can be pretty tough to deal with. If it's thin and it's got an arc, you know, even in some cases, specialty balloons are able to crack that substantially uh, with OCT. Good, good. Okay, Kevin, well, thanks for your fantastic contribution and uh, for um, sharing your thoughts with us today. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you very much. Nice to see everybody today. That wraps up the third session in the Calcium Masterclass series. Join us for Class 4 next Friday for insights into the mechanism of action of intravascular lithotripsy and clinical application. Our hosts will be James Spratt and Simon Wilson here in the studio in London, and we will be joined remotely by Michael Johnner, Nadia Sutton and Zaid Ali. Thanks very much. And goodbye for now. <laughs>